Pan Pan Psychast. Part three: Further analysis and discussion. Our inquiry question: Why are there so many construction vans outside, and? Why are all the construction workers wearing suits and tinted sunglasses? In our last instalment, we spoke about the NSA, we spoke about surveillance, capitalism, and how these government institutions are using big data collected by private companies to keep their beady little eyes on everything that we're doing. This is a relatively recent development sparked in part by the September 11th attacks which paved the way for the Patriot Act, other similar acts across Europe as well, which allow government institutions to monitor big data, to store large quantities of data and keep it all en masse rather than targeting specific individuals which they are suspicious of. A lot of the things that we know about the NSA and the government communications headquarters in the UK was revealed in 2013 when whistleblower Edward Snowden disclosed a series of documents to The Guardian. As Andrew said in our last instalment, this included information that the PRISM program for the NSA had accessed all the servers of the major tech companies. Apple, Google, Microsoft had access to all of the phone records and communications across the US and lots of places in Europe too, including, I'm quoting here, the US had spied on the EU offices in New York, Washington and Brussels, as well as the embassies of France, Greece, India, Italy, Japan, Mexico, South Korea and Turkey. So Jack's mentioned the government communication headquarters or the GCHQ, which is the British Intelligence and Security Agency. They were as guilty as the Americans of mass surveillance. When this news came out, of course, there was just as much of a scandal surrounding this in the UK as there was in the US. Like with the US, the UK took all the things or most of the things that had been publicly announced and then decided that they were going to just pass a law that said that all of this stuff was actually now legal. Um, So they weren't telling people about it before. They were quite happy to let this go completely unnoticed as long as nobody said anything about it. But as soon as it was public knowledge, well, they were going to just enshrine it into law. So the the Investigatory Powers Act passed in 2016 Mm. um, after it going through Parliament in 2015. And uh, there are probably loads more to it than this, but at least the big bits that were publicised and talked about in the press and what the BBC and stuff reported on was the fact that the government held the right to demand that internet service providers keep hold of a log of a year's worth of every IP address's internet use. Mm -hmm. And that includes every website that you've visited in a year, but they cannot get information of each page of which you have visited that website. Yeah, this law is candidly referred to as the Snoopers Charter, which I think is quite a funny name for it, even though it's not very funny at all. And like Andy said, it grants extensive surveillance powers to intelligence agencies and law enforcement. Like Andy said, be it communications data, internet browsing history, phone calls, emails, and much, much more. It has a bulk data collection. So the idea that, like Andy said, with GCHQ, that they have they have been involved in large bulk data collection programs, intercepting and analyzing internet traffic. The reason they're doing this is for safety, right? That's the guys it's done under, like we've mentioned again in the previous episodes, that this is a large amount of big data that the, the government has and that this surveillance uh, law that was passed, the Snoopers Charter, gives a lot of power to the government in terms of what they know about their citizens. This particular act has come up in the news really recently, actually, with Apple, who have have come out in criticism of the UK government for wanting to extend the powers of this act, which would allow the government to request that encrypted messaging apps are basically unencrypted for them to be able to, mm. to take information mm. from them. I, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what they said, but they were basically going to say, we'll, we'll just remove our services yeah. of FaceTime and iMessage from the UK mm. if you follow through with this. And so we'll, that, that is yet to be settled and exactly how that's going to play out. So we're well aware in the UK, and I think even in this conversation we've just had, Andrew made this joke about me being on the list. Like we're aware that people are watching, we'll pick up on certain bits of information that we're searching for online. And we've spoken about how that might limit our intellectual exploration but anywhere there's a sensor say people like edward snowden the vast majority of our information is automatically ingested without 
any targeting, which is a big change in the nature of prosecuting people for doing any kind of unlawful activity, for example, because you've got now got retroactive investigation. So all they need is a selector, some kind of information that they can identify us by and find the chain of information that we've been leaving behind for them. And I just want to say on the GCHQ point, because I thought this was really interesting, because a lot of the stuff which you encounter in the reading is about the US. But I like this quote from Snowden when he was speaking to the EU Parliament. And he says, the UK's GCHQ is the prime example of this due to what they refer to as a light oversight regime, which is a bureaucratic way of saying their spying activities are less restricted than is proper. In the US, we have a secret rubber stamp foreign intelligence surveillance court that only hears arguments from our government. Out of approximately 34,000 government requests over 33 years, the secret court rejected only 11 of these requests. If that's what heavy oversight looks like, he says, about the US, what does that tell us about the light oversight in the UK? Is that in the UK we have what he calls full take content in addition to the metadata. So whereas the NSA are only allowed to track the information about our information, in the UK they can track the information itself and it's light oversight, so you're not going to have them pushing back against requests to access that data. But the NSA can query our system as well because of the packs we have in national security. So they can check our data about the first-hand data of people too. But yeah, it has a very yeah, extensive and intrusive surveillance system, I think. If that's a shock, then <laughs> that's a bit... That's sorry. A good, sorry, uh, but yeah, it's uh, we have... Like, like even we mentioned in the previous episodes, right? Even just the amount and quantity of CCTV and mm. obviously the laws and powers that the government have and are like campaigning to extend, yeah, it's uh, it's inarguable, I think. Well, the biggest justification for this surveillance state is that you might think when we leave the state of nature, the one thing the state's supposed to secure for us is security to make sure that we're kept safe. Now, there are times, and a lot of the time, when security and our privacy are going to go hand in hand. Our ability to fulfill our projects, our ability to look after our property, be free from unjustified interference from other individuals and corporations and governments. Generally, you're thinking that they're going to work well together. This is a clear case when they're running quite harshly against one another. I just want to give a couple of examples of those who have defended the idea that this surveillance is helpful and benefits us for security and that security Security should trump privacy. And an example from William Stunts, he contends that, quote, effective, active government that innovates, that protects people who need protecting, that acts aggressively when action is needed is dying. Privacy and transparency are the diseases. We need to find a vaccine and soon. In an age of terrorism, privacy rules are not simply unaffordable, they are perverse. If we wanted a transparent security service, They'd know the sorts of things that we're monitoring. They'd know how to avoid them. And if we're constantly second-guessing our government officials who are trying to keep us safe, we're going to slow down the system with bureaucracy and we're going to fall victim of more terrorist attacks in the future. There are a number of responses to this type of thing. One, you then raises the question, when does this stop? Christopher Lee says the, the, the problem with things like the threat of terrorism or the threat of another pandemic or something is that that never goes away there is always a possibility that this sort of thing can happen again and and perhaps more so with terrorism than than global pandemics but the the, the fact is is that if we if we play by that then we'll never get back to what we was possibly quote normal before mass government surveillance became the norm why must i give away all of these other rights or freedoms for the possibility that something that may never stop like, continue to happen there is always going to be risk to living in the world to try and create ultimate safety and give up everything else is not the kind of world that a lot of people want to live in and so are prepared to make certain sacrifices and i know that this is quite a difficult conversation this is why this thing becomes really hard to debate because mm. somebody might just say like how dare you say that it's okay to allow the possibility of a terrorist attack the reality is is that that kind of thing can happen and we should try to prevent it but that doesn't mean we should reduce all of the other rights in society to that end either. Mm. Yeah, I think we can move into some analysis as we go in this third installment. This is one of the few things that I thought was a little bit wrong or overstated in the book. A bit of a straw man from the securities response is that I don't think they really think they're going to stop and live in this utopia without terrorism, right? And there, I think there are better responses you can give to the idea that you're trying to reduce the amount of terrorism yes. that takes place. True. And I think she does make this point, or it's elsewhere in one of the other books we read, that what we should be doing 
is weighing up the risk of data misuse when you collect it on such yeah. a scale in mm. comparison yes. to the to the And risk. appears to be at least the cons of this mass surveillance probably do outweigh mm. the benefits of it. So one of the things that Everly's points out is, is that while it is intuitive that if we collect loads of data that we will be able to better spot the criminals is that you're searching for the needle in the haystack, mm. the needle being the terrorist or, or, the, or the criminal. And yet all the data is the hay. And mm. the more hay you collect, the harder the needle is to find. So there's this, this problem that occurs with intelligence agencies is that they actually have so much noise that it's hard to pick out the the actual thing that they're looking out for. And this isn't just conjecture. There is evidence that points out that this seems to be the case. So it says, quote, only 1.2% of the tips from 2001 to 2004 were useful, as in tips to the FBI about finding particular criminals. When the FBI looked at the data from 2004 to 2006, they found that no tips had made a significant contribution. Sent from the NSA to the FBI were too many and too much of a waste of time. The FBI and the NSA both admitting that actually their attempts to stop terrorists have not really worked that well mm. given the amount of data that they are collecting. Big data is really useful for making psychological profiles of people and then you would assume then, okay, they could create a psychological profile for some form of terrorist and that you're looking for that pattern, right? So you can identify that individual and be right. like, this person's more likely to become a terrorist. Let's investigate them. But she mentions in the book, the thing is that there isn't really a set psychological profile for someone who's willing to become something like a suicide bomber. It's such an extreme thing and mm. so unlikely that all of this big, big data is ultimately useless in trying to find and identify this bucket, so to speak, this psychological profile. Because all these psychological profiles of known terrorists have been very, very different. But I'm not sure if I buy the analysis. There's just too much data. Snowden talks about this X key score, these interfaces which allow you to search through the data quite well. I'm not sure what she means by tipping off to the FBI either, whether that's tips from people letting them know like what might be the case or whether mm. it's the data itself. I read it as if the data that they've collected has, gave has information. given information that might lead to, to a successful capture or something like oh, that. Good. And actually, that very rarely does that actually help. Yeah. I think in, in actual fact, the terrorist acts are just going to be so rare or if the very few that they've managed to stop in comparison to those which have actually occurred should be the amount of terrorist mm. acts mm. of which we are risk of. After the Snowden leaks, Obama made this claim. He said that we know of at least 50 threats that have been averted because of this information, not just in the US, but in some cases, threats here in Germany. Obviously, he's speaking in Germany at the time. Mm. So lives have been saved and the encroachment of privacy has been strictly limited to court-approved process to relate to these particular categories. And the then NSA Director General Keith Alexander repeated this claim of the 54 different attacks that stopped. And Daniel Solov makes this point that it's so difficult to make a pro-con weighing up or whether it's beneficial because by the very nature of them keeping it secret, they have to not allow us the benefit of them being transparent so we can see how effective it is. It's really hard to get any information on it whatsoever. So you just get the NSA director going, yeah, 54 times. Mm. And that's all you're going to get. Mm. But then he was asked... In Congress, the same man, Alexander of the NSA, in October 2013, he was asked, would you agree that these 54 cases that keep getting cited by the administration were not all plots? And of the 54, only 13 had some nexus in the US. And he says, yes. Mm. Here's day 13 in the US by the year 2013. If what he's saying is right, and that's sort of the best of the information we're going to get, that's what you need to be weighing up against the risks and the intrusions of the surveillance state. Yeah, it's interesting that Chris Avili seems so uh, adamant that we shouldn't really trust anything that they're telling us. She says, quote, in the two decades it has been around, mass surveillance does not seem to have prevented terrorism, but has been very effective at stripping away the right to privacy of all internet users. So she clearly falls down on, on the side of whatever defense that groups like the, the NSA try to, to give us is mm. that we do not have enough proof to say that it is all worth it in the end. Okay, so we've just spoken about government surveillance, but let's bring it back to everyday people when you're talking about the philosophy of privacy. So you say, oh, privacy is a really important social value, right? And you'll have that person come up to you and be like, well, I don't have anything to hide. The nothing to hide argument. Uh, this was actually famously said by Eric Schmidt, who was uh, the head of Google, where he said, if you have something you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. <laughs> 
even though, just for the listeners' records, he actually asked Google to delete some of his private information, <laughs> which they later denied to do. So obviously, maybe he doesn't believe his own aphorism there. But yeah, this is the nothing to hide argument. I don't care about privacy. I have nothing to hide. Okay, if you haven't done anything wrong, then what have you got to worry about? Let big corporations and governments take your data. Yeah, and quickly on that, you can see how this is going to be used by governments exactly in the stuff we've been talking about with the terrorism stuff. They'll say preventing terrorism is of utmost importance and that your cries for democratic freedoms are not really at risk because as long as you're just a good citizen, then why does it matter if mm. we're looking at you? Because ultimately we're there to look for the criminals and if you're not a criminal why does it matter the thing is is that most people who say this kind of thing um are, are probably got something to hide too mm. in all of the books that we've all read this never really holds up to much actual scrutiny mm. there's a great cartoon in one of the books which is this lady in a shower obviously she's covered up in the shower in the cartoon but then there's a little eye on the wall of a shower she's like why are you watching me shower and the eye just says to her well if you've got nothing to hide yeah. then you shouldn't worry yeah. about I, it I saw a similar one which was like if you've ever been to the toilet you've got something to hide yeah. <laughs> which I thought was quite funny Neil Richards in his book explains that the nothing to hide argument focuses on privacy as an individual matter when in fact it is a social value Everybody has things to hide at certain points. Everybody requires and needs privacy for specific things. We've mentioned bathing, going to the toilet, an appointment with your doctor. All of these things require some form of privacy. It's not about hiding dark secrets, right? It's not like being scared about the bad things you've done in the past. Even if you've never done anything quote unquote bad in your entire life, privacy is still a social value that you should respect and value because it helps and supports everybody. Everyone's got something to hide, even if you don't think you do. Quote, the argument is wrong on its own terms. This is the case because everybody has something to hide, or at least everyone has facts about themselves that they don't want shared, disclosed or broadcast <laughs> indiscriminately. And that's just true. There are just lots of things that Ollie has just mentioned there that aren't deviant behaviours. It's just... You would rather not have that all public. Neil Richards also says it's human impulse to confide with our friends and family and disclose information. In fact, quite a lot of relationships and trust within a family will be the keeping secret of specific information, confiding in someone that you trust and trusting them that they won't broadcast that information to loads of other people, right? That yeah. can be a core part of what it means to be a human in a social group. And actually, we view people that can't hold specific private information with suspicion and we don't reveal secrets to them and that's just like a core way of how human beings socially interact with all of that information that could be leaked about you or or shared without your consent is that that can um not just have to be anything as big as blackmail it can just be used against you uh, and make your your experience of the online space worse because of that but mm -hmm. but then there's all that deeper stuff about the democratic stuff as well that we spoke to at length yeah. so we don't need to give you all of those points again it should be very evident by now if you've listened through all of the episodes about why privacy should matter even when you have nothing to hide i think it can be summed up quite nicely by a quote from edward snowden which is arguing that you don't care about the right to privacy because because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying that you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. So we've spoken about two of the weaker objections to privacy as a right. We're going to move on to some of the stronger objections here. The first being feminism, the second the clashes between freedom of expression and privacy. The feminist one's a really interesting one. I think it motivates us to take a more nuanced take towards privacy. Something we haven't spoken about is how Neil Richard thinks that we should be plugging into privacy and getting out of privacy, the values which we hold in wider society. And so you might think that when it comes to feminist approaches to privacy, on the one hand, we've got this argument to say that privacy allows injustices to happen upon vulnerable people within the homes in particular. Having a, a public space and a private space and you have no right to know what goes on in my home, to put it broadly and crudely, would allow somebody to be mistreated in that home. You can see how women might continue to be subjected to such treatment across society. Yeah, just a quick quote from Anita Allen from her book, Unpopular Privacy. She says, feminist philosophy with its characteristic emphasis on problems of domination, subordinating paternal 
journalism, unequal opportunities, and second-class citizenship have helped to illuminate the justice and injustice of popular and unpopular privacy mandates targeting women. It's easy to say, oh, this happened loads more in the past, and it, and it probably did, but it still definitely happens to this mm. day where women are going to be disproportionately affected by this general social norm that the, the home is a private space and mm. what happens in the home, it kind of stays there. And that if perhaps if you, you overheard something happening in your neighbor's house is that you wouldn't necessarily step in because it's none of your business. And that this type of environment has traditionally led to acts of abuse and control that disproportionately affect the mm. women of the households. Therefore, there has been a strong undercurrent within feminist thought that has said that privacy is not always a good thing because privacy keeps people quiet. Mm -hmm. It doesn't allow discussion. If you ever have come across the work of Amanda Fricker with the stuff about in testimonial injustice, give you the, the, the short version of it, but in... in in general, the, the point being made by Fricker and others like her is that in particular, women's testimonies are often not listened to or not respected as much as men's in, in certain cultures. And that if they don't feel like they can voice stuff or that their, their, their opinions are invalid, is that mm. that keeps them silent. And she also talks about hermeneutical injustices as well, where this environment also creates this type of environment where there's not language that women could share with one another and talk about what's happening in the homes, and which mm. also just creates constant cycle of um, people are, are trapped or a, or a suffering domestic abuse with no real way out of it. And so this means that actually sometimes it is good that information is shared, even if it is particularly scandalous or taboo or things that go against the more powerful members of a society. And that this is the way that law actually progresses to keep people safe. And so we should always keep in the back of our mind that there's, there's going to be this tension between rights of privacy and, and other rights that are incredibly important for people in society. You see these similar threats coming out across a range of philosophies, don't you, as well? I think we've spoken about this too, how de Beauvoir speaks about how women being put into individual houses, not being able to mm. join together as a group and have that shared identity of the injustices that they face. Feminist Marxist views of how private ownership and private control of one's own space can lead to these injustices too. Uh, Nita Allen, you mentioned a moment ago, Andrew, she also says that women do have an interest in avoiding things like state-imposed sterilization, freedom over their reproductive decisions, and freedom from government-imposed drug tests and the like. So there are some aspects of privacy that you want. It would just take us a very long time, which we yeah, don't have here, course. to pick out all the yeah. bits that you do and don't want. Yeah, and of course, and, and going back to the online space is that we know that, that women are disproportionately far more affected by things like non-consensual pornography mm. as well, mm. which Danielle Citron dedicates a large chunk of her book to the efforts used to try and combat that particular crime. The fact is, is that I hope you've understood this all of, through the discussions we had is that it's just a complicated issue. Certain primacies are good, certain ones mm. are not so good, and ones matter more depending on the context that you happen to find yourself in. So I think this is a good point to say that nobody wants absolute privacy, right? Similarly, nobody wants to accept the extreme claim that security always overrides privacy or some other factor always overrides privacy. So we want like drug and alcohol tests for our airline pilots, but at the same time, we don't want someone following us around at every point of the day. The interesting question is the borderline cases, mm. stop and search, mandatory and random drug testing, using these heat sensors through people's walls to see if they're like growing marijuana and things like that, whether or not these are infringements on privacy or not. Now, the one of the clash we wanted to speak about was the tension between freedom of expression and privacy. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting. There's lots of dialogue online about free speech, some of it very sensible, some of it kind of a little bit silly. Uh, I, I want to pick a particular example. In March 2023 in the UK, uh, there's a journalist here called Isabel Oakshot. She released something called the Lockdown Files to the newspaper, The Daily Telegraph. Now, these were private messages, specifically WhatsApp messages, that were sent to and from the phone of someone called Matt Hancock, who was the health secretary in the UK during the COVID pandemic. Now, Oakshot was hired by Hancock to help him write a book. She was effectively his ghostwriter. And in the process of writing that book, he revealed to her these messages and information mm. about how the pandemic was handled in the UK. 
And she thought that this information was so valuable and so important that it was, quote, in the public interest and released it. Specifically, if we just go into some examples, because I think they'll help us with the arguments. She was really worried that the government itself was deliberately trying to overscare the public, that the government was, quote, ignoring the science and not following the advice of the science advisor who was called Chris Whitty, that the government had unprecedented power arbitrary decision making and was not subject to appropriate checks and balances and scrutiny even from within its own cabinet so there were people within the cabinet of the government itself that weren't aware of some of the decisions that were being made Mm. so in her opinion she believed it was in the public interest and without telling matt hancock released the lockdown files so they could be scrutinized in public do we think that the public interest in understanding these messages does that override matt hancock's right to privacy and giving these messages to another person with the agreement being be it written or non-written that she would not share this private information with other people just to backtrack before i give an answer to okay. the question <laughs> just so we clear on the the facts before applying them to like law and ethics to this issue the case in point first thing to think to say because we went right into the tension It's like security and privacy. Often freedom of expression and freedom of thought is going to go hand in hand in privacy Mm -hmm. for the reasons we gave in the first installment. Second is the the actual law in terms of human rights. Article 12, United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and Article 17 say that no one shall be subjected to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his privacy. And this includes home, family and correspondence. And everyone has the right to the protection of law against such interference. But then on the other hand, the European Convention on Human Rights says that everyone has a right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to hold opinions and to receive in part information and ideas without interference by public authority. Typical law is that you can publish this information as a journalist, for example, if it's in the public interest. Mm. There's loads of examples when this isn't in the interest. And the famous Leveson inquiry in Britain found that there were serious and uncorrected failures from passing off fiction as fact to paying lip service to accuracy in doing so far from holding power to account. The press is exercising unaccountable power, which nobody holds to account. Mm. So I think we should bear them off straight away and be like, here's a really like tricky issue where mm. it's really difficult to see which is right and wrong. Mm. Most of the stuff is being passed off in the public interest is not putting the record straight, mm. but is just putting it out there for the profit of, of that particular mm. news outlet. Uh, let's let's just give her the benefit of the doubt and say this was entirely altruistic and not a move to make her career go in a different trajectory. Mm. I don't know. I'm not going to... Uh, it's not my place to say on that. I don't think the way it was released is the best way to do it. Is that even if you believed that this information needed to be public information, mm. is that there are probably more appropriate channels to do than leaking it to a newspaper mm. because you don't know how the editorial line is going to present that information, mm. what they will include or not include. And even if they include everything, is it their job to be able to share this information? So why that could not not have uh, gone through an avenue that involves the actual government and a process through parliament in which this information is then properly declared. That probably makes more sense. I mean, Matt Hancock, by the sounds of it, knew that some of this information would likely come into public knowledge Mm. in the first place. That's why he presumably shared this information with her so Mm. the book could be published Mm. and so i don't necessarily feel too bad for matt hancock i just don't think (laughs) that anybody feels too bad for matt hancock um but like but (laughs) i don't but i don't think that the information he shared should have been released in that Mm. manner Mm. however does it tick the right boxes for free speech in terms of is it public interest does it help democratic processes is it important to help you be a citizen in this country yeah that information deserved to be shared how that happened i don't know what the exact best answer to that is but Mm. i feel like there are more official processes that could have gone through to allow that to happen i think holding power to account is probably one of the better reasons for breaking of matt hancock's privacy but it's not just about him it's about a wider picture that involves the lives of hundreds of thousands of people and i think if you're gonna think of an example where information that needs to be released to the public that is in the public's interest i think it's undeniably that it is i agree with you though that yeah selling it potentially i don't know if it happened i'm just speculating but yeah if you're selling it to a newspaper or releasing it in a certain outlet like you say it's going to have a particular lens on that issue let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to all of our data-driven patrons for making the show possible in particular a very special thank you to The man whose browsers track purchases of red trousers, it's Dan Posh. He loves nothing more than a targeted ad, it's Zarchery Arnold. 
tracking your weight and music tastes, it's Matt Carrera. His Neuralink chip's always malfunctioning, it's Neural Surge. He loves plugging into clouds, it's Anthony Welsh. The chilling effect of surveillance makes her stomach turn, it's ill eyes are used. And last but not least, the omniscient being tracking all human activity across the globe, defending our freedom, security and democracies, it's Big Brother's bigger brother, Mr. Jim Clare. If you're enjoying the show and you want to help us cultivate conservatism, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash poundsidecast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into it. We've just spoken about some of the tensions between things like freedom of expression, feminism in relation to privacy. We want to end our episode with talking about some of the more obvious things, some of the issues, the systemic ones especially, that we've spoken about throughout this episode and what we can do if we buy the arguments that we've been discussing. And one of the great things about Carissa Villiers' book is that she talks about these responses at length. I think she dedicates about half the book to things we can be doing. We're going to dedicate about five minutes. <laughs> yeah. We ran out of time. But we'll try our best. One of the big ones is, un- unsurprisingly, is the way that the data is actually not just collected, but then sold. Mm. And Carissa Villiers says that there, there is no good argument for the, the existence of what are called data brokers we referenced cambridge analytica in in our uh, second part and they are an example of a data broker they collect information and then they sell it on to other parties well how prevalent is this well uh, according to daniel citron in 2004 there were approximately 500 companies peddling our personal data and by 2020 there were more than 4,000 data brokers and this is in the just the u.s alone collectively with a dossier of 98 percent of americans Mm. so Data brokers have, if basically, if you're an American citizen, a company, not just the government, have a profile on you. If you're in the UK, it's exactly the same thing. There are about three companies that have it dossiers on, I think it's literally if not 100 percent very close to every single person in the uk has like some data points that have been collected on them these companies have your information what's the issue here well i mean like out of just general interest you might want to be aware that actually anybody can buy your Mm. your information uh there are websites out there that you can spend so for example one you can spend about 25 dollars a month and that gives you access to, to do background checks on anybody you type in their name you'll be given information about them and there are other ones which you can pay just for one person that you want to search for these people according to, to all of the writers that we've been reading i mean their their whole business model is just take your stuff and then sell it on for anybody who mm-hmm. literally anyone, literally anyone and not yeah not like yeah. not just big companies <laughs> anybody who wants to buy this stuff can find can find stuff out the, the argument to be made here is is that this simply just shouldn't exist. It violates people's privacy to an extent that even if you wanted to say, well, what about economic freedom and aren't you stifling things and and not allowing free trade and all of this stuff? And, and the argument is, is that actually we regulate quite a lot of things for other people's mm. rights and that this is just another example of actual government regulation that isn't overstepping the boundaries. Mm. There is no good reason for why data brokers need to exist. The sooner we put that into law and stop this being a business practice, the better. One of the other recommendations she gives is that we encourage policymakers to stop targeted advertising. I think I'll buy this one in a strong sense in terms of sensitive information. There are a lot of examples of people who suffer from domestic abuse, sexual violence. They might be suffering for um, impotence, uh, some kind of STI. Uh, They might be depressed and advertisements targeted ads will pick out those features of the character through the cookies or spyware if you want to give them their proper name and target those people with advertisements with that sense of information. You think that's really intrusive? Uh, Certainly from a consumer rights perspective, sort of stuff should be stopped. But she also tries this argument and here's a little bit of analysis on the book is that there are some occasions where she's a little bit sweeping or I thought some of the empirical claims be scrutinized. She tries this method of argument where she goes, 
Well, this isn't bad for the advertisers either, because, and I'm quoting from it directly here, preliminary research shows that advertising using cookies does increase revenue, but only by around 4%, an average increase of just 0.0008 per ad, an average increase of just 0.0008 dollars per ad. Yet advertisers are willing to pay much more for targeted ad than for non-targeted ads. And I thought, this is really odd. That's really stupid if they're advertising and paying for targeted ads at the cost of our sensitive personal data, if they're only making such a tiny percentage on the dollar. Did a little bit of digging. And what I found is the paper that this is based on, Online Tracking and Publishers Revenues and Empirical Analysis, says in, in the introduction, targeted advertising consists of multiple players, including advertisers, company that buy ads, and publishers, websites that sell ads. Mm. We investigate how the presence or absence of a user's tracking cookie, which affects the ability of the firms to behave your target ads, impact the publisher's revenue from displaying the ad. Our findings so far suggest that when the user's cookie is available, the publisher's revenue increases. So Facebook, for example, only make a very small profit on selling targeted ads. Mm. But that's not true for the people who are using the targeted ads themselves, selling their product through Facebook. Mm. So I thought, look at personalized online advertising effectiveness, uh, a paper, The Interplay of What Went Aware, another one from the Journal of Advertising, Online Behavior Advertising, Literature Review and Research Agenda. And they're pretty strong that the trend in terms of personalized ads do work for the companies that are putting the personalized ads there. One of the hangups I had with the empirical stuff in the book, that it does work for the target ads and there is an incentive to keep doing it. I don't think she brings it up specifically with that example that you've just used, but her likely response to that would simply just be that it's not the only business model that can be used. Yeah. And so there are other ways to do advertising that is less invasive mm. and that if you're balancing what might be described as human rights versus a little bit of extra profit then there are certain things that people are going to say are more valuable than mm. the money that you get not to mention the certain websites and i know this is not going to be necessarily a route that every single person would be able to take immediately but she does make the point to say like with google is that if google charged people i think it said 10 pounds or something even just a year that google would make the amount yeah. of money mm. that they get from you as an individual using their quote free mm. uh, products every year at least I, I can say for myself as a consumer I, I currently I use google as little as possible but if i were to start using them again i would pay 10 pounds to use their services if that meant that i could use youtube google search google maps without any of my data being sold on mm. i think that's a good deal mm. i mean to the point where i would pay more than that uh, a year <laughs> like that's that's, Slow a, down, Andy. that's a lot that's a lot <laughs> of good tech that's benefits my life mm. and i don't mind paying for a service that i think is worthwhile mm. and ultimately that's where i'd rather see some of this stuff go mm. as seemingly as a society uh, or at least companies seem to feel this way is that they are trapped in a business model that they have to do to succeed mm. and they have no benefit right now in charging people for things where they could make more money selling it for you for free as it were so a round of concluding remarks would you would you like the jingle sure Concluding Remarks. Mr. Ollie Marley, would you like to kick us off? So firstly, I just want to thank Andy for picking the topic. I was a bit sceptical about the philosophy of privacy before I did any of the reading, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I would strongly recommend Privacy is Power and Why Privacy Matters. Uh, those two texts are excellent. With regards to my own attitude towards privacy and, and the discussions that we've had and what I've been thinking about, I'm really curious to see what happens in the future and the somewhat quite immediate future, I think, with regards to privacy policy, especially in places like the UK and the US and other European countries. It feels like it's been a bit of a wild west at the moment, especially with tech companies, where tech companies have pretty much been allowed to do whatever they want. Um, there's a really great bit in Neil Richards' book where he talks about the car, like when the car was first invented, mm -hmm. and how you didn't have to drive on a certain side of the road. There were no seat belts. There were barely any like airbags or safety precautions. And of course, loads of people got harmed. Loads of people died. And since then, since the invention of the car, we've come up with more restrictions. You have to drive on a certain side of the road. You have to wear a seat belt and etc. And less people have been harmed. And I think we're in a really similar position with privacy and with big data. Hopefully, by listening to the episode today, the, you know, you, dear listener, have learned a little bit more about it and enjoyed those discussions and examples we've used. And yeah, and I'm just really curious to see what happens next. Mr. Andrew Horton. I, of course 
just echo a lot of what Ollie has just said there. This is uh, the often said line at this point in the discussion. Part of me wants to be optimistic and say that actually a lot of the reading that I've done on this has shown me that there are a lot of really intelligent, well-meaning people who want to try and push back against a lot of the privacy invasions that have happened uh, in the last two decades plus and that's good news it means that actually this is something that people have been talking about taking seriously for quite a while that we are moving in a direction where i think that we will begin to see more and more laws Mm -hmm. trying to regulate this stuff i think my biggest gripe with all of this stuff is really just and maybe there'll be less and less of this with people growing up now but i just really feel like this was something i just completely sleepwalked into when i first set up a facebook account or or Mm. when i started using the internet i I just never once thought Mm. that everything i did left a trail it just that was that kind of thing just wasn't taught to me when i was younger now as we've said throughout the episodes is that so much of our lives rely on this technology and even if i wanted a way out i can't really do that Mm. and that to me feels really not okay Mm. i hope that we have more conversations about this as a society and that governments are are largely held more accountable and businesses for that matter are held more accountable for the the data breaches that they are guilty of so we'll we'll see moving ahead how that how that goes i'd like to echo both of your (laughs) concluding remarks one of my concluding remarks and what will i go away and think about there's lots of things that i really wanted to discuss which we've crammed a lot into these three installments Mm. and there's still stuff there on memory a right to be forgotten on the fact that privacy isn't just about creepiness that i wish we could have spoken about what privacy isn't all the what privacy isn't stuff and i really enjoy that neil richard's book on the topic of why privacy matters. Things about the GDPR stuff as well. It's nice Mm. to see, as Ollie's mentioned there, that there is legislation especially happening in Europe that's going some way combating some of these data misuses, but they're not without their problems Mm. as well. There's examples of people making these data access requests and getting information about partners, spouses, and them not really guarding against that. And so it's leading to more breaches, people abusing the system, especially abusing schools in terms of using them no win no fee Mm. systems in terms of just making data requests and how much time and work it takes for public institutions to get that data Mm. and produce it and redact it all takes an enormous amount and i think that pushes us towards though better systems of collecting data if you if we manage to develop systems where you can control it better in an easy way you can streamline it quite significantly i think yeah i think having a public conversation about what we mean by privacy and how much we value privacy is long overdue and it's really important in the age of information uh, I was going to speak about the example of Meghan and Harry, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex at some stage. I'll give it a brief mention just because I feel like <laughs> he's a concluding <laughs> remark. <Jack. laughs> is that there's this huge like idea that there's just public drama or celebrity gossip and things like that. The idea that people fund this weird thing of the royal family in the UK and then expect to have access to all features of their lives. And I think there's the South Park episode which recently came out, which was really popular online in which Meghan and Harry are portrayed as wanting privacy in the sense that didn't want people snooping, harassing them, but didn't want privacy in the sense that they wanted to publish stuff out there for the world and share their story. And obviously there's different ideas of privacy at play there that if we just spent a moment to think about as a as a country or a collective what the different values that motivate those different ideas of privacy were then we can have a better discussion about people's right to privacy yeah i've maybe i need to stop sharing my location with so many people and find my (laughs) (laughs) a good step in the right direction hey it's time for everybody's favorite part of the show it's pop pop philosophy quiz Pop pop pop, 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 Philosophy quiz. Andrew, remind us of the rules. D- do we do that? Do we need r- r- reminding of the rules? Yes, okay. you're going to get quotes from three <laughs> different people and it's fastest finger to guess who the quote is from. It's Andrew versus Ollie and we're playing Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden. You got quotes from an Edward, a.k.a. Eddie Murphy, best known for his roles in Shrek 1, Shrek 2, Shrek the 3rd, <laughs> and Shrek Forever After. 
You've got quotes from Snowden, a.k.a. Amanda Holden, one of Britain's most talented talent <laughs> experts. It's Britain's Got Talent. I'm surprised you didn't Judge do quotes Amanda. from Mount Snowden. That would have been pretty No, good. well, that, I couldn't think of one. So we've got Amanda Holden, right. the... Britain's Got Talent judge, yeah, yeah, because yeah. she recently visited oh, right. North, Wales, North Wales, which right. is near, near Mount Snowdon. Snowdon. Yeah, yeah. So you've got quotes from Eddie Murphy, Amanda <laughs> Holden, and then Edward Snowden, former right. NSA contractor. So hang on, wait, so Edward and whistleblower. Snowden, Edward Ed- Snowden. Go- but Snowden is... It's Eddie Murphy, Amanda Holden, and Edward Snowden. Yeah, right. The advice I would give to someone is not to take anyone's advice. Eddie Murphy. That's Eddie Murphy. Well done, one little Ollie. At 15, the only hucking up I'd ever done a, involved a modem. A man, no. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you said the last bit, Snowden. <laughs> I haven't read a newspaper in 20 years. I don't look at the Amanda computer Holden. or anything. You have to filter on what you let in. Eddie Murphy. It's Eddie Murphy. It's two ones. Andy, you, you don't have to be a closet fetishist Eddie to Murphy. have done things that embarrass you. you Edward Snowden. It's Edward Stone. It's 3-1. Okay. You might have seen a house fly, maybe in a super Eddie fly. Murphy. But I bet you ain't seen a donkey fly. <laughs> I'm not performing anymore. I reveal myself Eddie to the Murphy. audience. Yeah. Yeah. It's Eddie Murphy. People have been able to see that as cheeky was... and as flirty as I am, Amanda Amanda, Holden, yeah. I'm not the dreadful slapper that the press is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was running late one Tuesday morning. I was speeding down Route 32 under a beautiful Microsoft blue sky. <laughs> Edward Snowden. <laughs> what? What is, is that like the opening line of his book? Or no, something? it's it's uh, it's yeah, it's in his book. <laughs> yeah. I don't care who or what judges me. Nothing's going to stop me from living my Amanda life. Holden. Now I choose. That's Amanda Holden. It's five four to Andy. Last two. I want to be buried with a mobile phone just in case I'm not dead. Eddie Ed- Murphy. It's not Eddie Murphy. <sighs> Edward Snowden. It's not Edward Snowden. Yeah, I'm giving Ollie the point. Yeah, That's yeah. five four. And the last no, one the, here, the, the decider. Breaker. I didn't want to live in a world where everyone had to pretend they were perfect. Oh, that could be any Which of one. them. Uh, I'm going to go Edward Snowden. It's Edward Snowden. Ah. Andrew wins the day. Hey, I really enjoyed that discussion. That was great. Well, the quiz as well. The quiz yeah. is okay. It was good fun. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed listening as well, dear listener. We're going to crack open a non-alcoholic beer and enjoy an after show once this is done. Thank you again for supporting us on Patreon, like on Facebook, share on Twitter. (laughs) Make sure you subscribe as well. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, beautiful, soothing voices of Mr. Oli Marley. Arguing that you don't care about the right to privacy because you have nothing to hide, it's no different than saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. Dr. Jack Sides. Duck, duck, go. (laughs) And me, Mr. Andrew Horton. Freedom must mean more than just the freedom to be like everybody else. Uh, I like how one of the pieces of advice were, to make my point about it, I often say when I'm asked my email, none of your business at privacy.com. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine how someone would react if you did that? <laughs> none of your business? Uh, or the advice to let somebody know that you've got a smart device yeah. in your house. Do you want to get some wine and head back to my place? I should let you know that I've got a, <laughs> I've got a few smart devices. I don't know if you want to. Yeah. Don't know if you want to get down, but I've got a I've got a doorbell camera. <laughs> Just to warn you. <laughs>